A uh, quorum uh, being present, the hearing of the subcommittee will come to order. Uh, pursuant to committee rule 12, any member may submit an opening statement in writing, which will be made part of the uh, permanent record. And I recognize myself for an opening statement. I'm pleased to welcome the public and our witnesses to this hearing of the subcommittee on early childhood, elementary and secondary education, challenges facing Bureau of Indian Education Schools in improving student achievement. Last year, we held a hearing on the Gila River Reservation in the district of our fellow subcommittee member, Mr. Grijalva. That hearing was on how the No Child Left Behind Act has impacted Indian education generally. Today's hearing is on issues facing Bureau of Indian Education funded schools specifically. Uh, nearly 50,000 students, 10% of all Indian students, attend one of the 184 BIE schools. Of the 184 BIE operates, 61 directly and contract with tribes to operate the other 123. It was in the early days of my tenure here in Congress that we began to encourage the contract schools. And uh, uh, Al Qui used to sit right here, Al Qui, who later on became governor of um, Minnesota, uh, played a very important role in that. And I think Al Qui and the governor sitting next to me right now have both illustrated through those 32 years that Indian education has been a real genuine a bipartisan concern. I've had an abiding interest in Indian education since my election to the Michigan legislature in 1965. In Michigan, I wrote the Michigan Indian Tuition Waiver Act to bring the state into compliance with its treaty obligation. The act provides for a tuition-free education for Michigan Indians at Michigan public colleges. Uh, Jackie Vaughn and I, who's now gone on to his eternal reward, and I wrote that bill and the governor signed the bill. A Democratic Congress passed it, signed again by a Republican governor, again illustrating that we have a bipartisan concern with our obligations to America's first citizens. Today I'm able to express that interest not only through my chairmanship of this subcommittee, but also as the founder and Democratic chairman of the House Native American Caucus and as a member of the Natural Resources Committee. I often say that land and language are the two anchors for protecting tribal sovereignty. A third anchor for protecting tribal sovereignty is education. History has presented us with unique challenges in providing every Indian child with the education he or she needs to better their and their family's station in life. But in one respect, the challenge facing tribes is the same challenge faced anywhere in the United States. Our success in the 21st century economy is directly tied to our ability to produce a high quality labor force. And that ability is of course directly tied to our ability to meet the challenge of providing every child, including every Indian child, with a world-class education. And that is why we are here today. We have a distinguished panel of witnesses who will provide us with insight on the unique challenges facing BIE schools and improving student education. Because while the need for education may be the same everywhere, the way to educate children is not. Our witnesses will discuss a recent Government Accountability Office report on how to improve BIE's assistance to tribes to help them implement academic accountability systems under NCLB that take into account Indian culture and languages. The report identifies a number of shortcomings in that assistance. Moving forward, we must clarify the roles and responsibilities of the many agencies involved, the Departments of the Interior and Education, states, and tribes. And in particular, we must ensure that the tribes, which are sovereign entities, are full partners in the process. The law contemplates that the federal government will work with the tribes, not dictate to the tribes. And that the process work out a system that is relevant to the unique situation of the tribes, including their culture 
and language. Some of our witnesses also will discuss the need to increase federal support for Indian education, and that also is critical. So I look forward to the testimony, and it's my pleasure to yield to my good friend, um, the Governor of Delaware, Mr. Castle. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for this hearing. Thank you for your interest in education, and particularly Indian education. Uh, you are deeply steeped in this, and for that, we're all very appreciative. And we thank our witnesses uh, for being here, for uh, making themselves available to us today. and look forward to your testimony, as a matter of fact. As most of you know, the federal government, through the U.S. Department of Interior's Bureau of Indian Education, which is the BIE we refer to, provides educational assistance to Indian children to ensure that they receive a high-quality education comparable to their peers. Currently, the BIE-funded education system for Indian students includes 174 schools and 14 peripheral dormitories for students attending public schools nearby. The No Child Left Behind Act requires states and the BIE to define and determine whether schools are making adequate yearly progress towards meeting the goal of 100 percent academic proficiency. In June of this year, the U.S. Government Accountability Office, which we know as GAO, issued a report that examined how the BIE and Indian tribes have implemented the requirements of uh, No Child Left Behind. The report, entitled Improving Interiors Assistance Would Help Some Tribal Groups Implement Academic Accountability Systems, found that BIE and almost all of its schools have adopted state definitions of AYP. The report did note, however, that the BIE has not completed agreements with several key states delineating the terms of BIE-funded schools' access to the state assessment systems. As the BIE moves forward with the process of improving student academic achievement, and as No Child Left Behind is considered for reauthorization, I believe as many proponents of American education do that we must explore options which can provide additional flexibility to BIE schools in helping them meet the law's requirements. Although I believe strongly that the BIE should continue to have the flexibility necessary to develop assessments that accurately measure student achievement, Congress must work to ensure that we and the BIE remain committed to the high standards and quality all students and schools should be held to. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses about what is happening in the ground regarding this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Castle. I would uh, now like to introduce the, the very distinguished panel of witnesses uh, here with us this morning. Uh, Cornelia Ashby is Director of, the, of Education, Workforce, and Income Security Issues for the Government's Accountability Office. Ms. Ashby joined GAO in 1973. In 1992, she was selected for GAO's Senior Executive uh, Candidate Development Program, and in 1994 was appointed an Associate Director for Education and Employment Issues. She began her current position in the year 2000. Dr. Willard Gilbert is President of the National in Indian Education Association and a Professor of Education at Northern Arizona University. Dr. Gilbert is an expert on integrating native language culture, and traditions into the school curricula, a critical issue in Indian education. Stan Holder is the chief of the Bureau of Indian Education's Division of Performance and Accountability, where he administers all programs funded under NCLB for the Bureau. He has published research on instructional and behavioral programs that improve student achievement and behavioral outcomes. He also is a former vice president of the Wichita and affiliated tribes. Anne uh, Dudrow is Chief of Staff for the Department of Education's Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, Ms. Dudrow joined the department in 2005 as a Special Assistant to the Secretary. She also was appointed that year as a member of the U.S. Delegation to the 33rd General Conference of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural organization. I now ask unanimous consent to yield to Representative Stephanie Herseth Sandlin to introduce our next witness, Ted Hamilton. In the yielding, I would like to note that it is my pleasure to serve with her both on the Natural Resources Committee and the Native American Caucus. She is an outstanding advocate on education and Indian issues, and I yield to her. 
Well, thank you very much, Chairman Kildee and Ranking Member Castle, for holding this very important hearing, for your extraordinary leadership on this issue, and for allowing me a chance to join you on the dais for purposes of introducing a fellow South Dakotan and a leader in Indian education, Mr. Ted Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton is the Executive Director of the Ochiti Shakawi Education Consortium, also referred to as OSEC. He has 22 years of experience working with tribal colleges, grant schools, and public schools across the Great Plains. Mr. Hamilton was one of the founders of OSEC, started nearly 10 years ago. Based on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, OSEC is comprised of numerous tribal colleges and tribal schools and provides a range of valuable services to these schools. Through his work with schools eager to develop an alternative adequate yearly progress standard, Mr. Hamilton has become intimately familiar with the impacts of No Child Left Behind in Bureau of Indian Education schools. I know you'll appreciate his insights and perspective on the matters before the subcommittee today. With 22 schools operated by the Bureau of Indian Education in South Dakota, the topics that will be addressed today are of critical importance to the Native communities in my state. In March of 2006, Chairman George Miller and I conducted a series of visits to Indian Country Schools in southwestern South Dakota. After meeting with educators, administrators, students, and concerned community members, two themes emerged. The importance of considering Native culture within achievement and accountability standards, and the unique management challenges created by the BAA's authority over much NCLB implementation. As we all know, the federal government has a unique government-to-government -government relationship with American Indian tribes, and this relationship is based on the United States Constitution and hundreds of treaties signed by tribes in the U.S. government. Education is one treaty-based responsibility. The GAO study confirms what schools in my district have reported. The federal government still has work to do to better uphold its trust responsibilities with regard to Indian education. When we consider that only 31 percent of BIA schools Less than one in three met adequate yearly progress in 2007. It's clear that Congress must work to address the challenges facing these schools. The Department of the Interior and the Department of Education should continue and engage with tribes in a manner that respects tribal sovereignty and empowers tribal self-determination. So again, thank you for holding this hearing, for allowing me to introduce Mr. Hamilton this morning. I commend his testimony to all of you on the subcommittee. This hearing is really an important, a truly important step toward assessing the impact of NCLB in Indian Country and guiding our future actions to further improve education of Native students across the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And again, welcome uh, to all our witnesses. Uh, for those who have not testified before this subcommittee before, I will explain our, our lighting system uh, and the five-minute rule. Everyone, including members, um, is limited to five minutes for presentation or questioning. The green light will be illuminated when you begin to speak. When you see the yellow light, it means that you have one minute remaining. When you see the red light, it means your time has expired and you need to conclude your testimony. Now, there's no ejection seat there, so you, you may at least finish up your sentence or, or your paragraph and, and conclude in a, in a gentle way. Um, please be certain as you testify to turn on and speak into the microphone in front of you and turn it off when you're finished. We will now hear from our first witness, uh, Cornelia Ashby, Director, Education, Workforce, and Income Security Issues of the U.S. Government Accountability Office. You may begin. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the challenges tribal groups and BIE schools face with respect to the measurement of Indian students' academic progress. My testimony is based largely on our June 2008 report on this topic. As a condition for receiving grants under NCLBA, schools, including BIE schools, must measure yearly progress in meeting academic standards in math, reading, and science. In 2005, as required by NCLBA, the Secretary of the Interior determined that to measure such progress, each BIE school would use the definition of adequate yearly progress of the state in which the school is located. Recognizing that students in BIE schools may have unique needs and special circumstances, NCLBA allows tribal groups to waive all or part of the Secretary's definition of AYP and propose an alternative. 
Under BIE regulations, the definition of AYP covers the academic standards and assessments used in measuring academic progress. Although all of the 174 BIE schools have measured academic progress, almost all have measured academic progress in accordance with their state's definition of AYP. To establish the terms under which BIE schools access assessments and scoring arrangements, BIE has established memorandums of understanding with about half of the 23 states that have BIE schools. While the remaining states, with the exception of California, have allowed BIE schools access to their assessments, without MOUs there is increased risk that the terms of access will change. California officials have not given the two BIE schools in the state access to the state assessment because they fear breach in security. They only administer the assessment to public schools in California. However, state officials were willing to make an exception for BIE schools, but requested a $1 million bond in security. BIE and education officials are trying to work with the state to resolve the issue. Three tribal groups, the Navajo Nation, the Ocheti Sakui Education Consortium, known as OSEC, and the Miccosukee, representing BIE schools in five states and about 44% of BIE students are in the early stages of developing alternative definitions of AYP. Officials from the Navajo Nation with BIE schools in three states have requested technical assistance for developing an alternative definition of AYP, citing the desire to include cultural components in the standards and assessments, compare the progress of Navajo students across states and develop a Navajo-specific measure that could influence AYP determination regardless of the state in which the school is located. OSCC seeks to develop alternative standards and an alternative assessment to improve student performance, define the graduation rate to include six years rather than four, and replace the attendance component with a language and culture component. The Miccosukee Tribe of Florida is considering options for developing an alternative assessment and developing standards for Miccosukee culture and language to serve as the additional AYP indicator in lieu of attendance for their students in third through eighth grade. Other tribal groups have not pursued alternatives for various reasons, including the desire to maintain compatibility with public schools in their state and potential challenges and resources required to develop alternatives. For example, officials representing BIE schools in California, Mississippi, and Washington told us that it was important that their schools be compatible with the local public schools. In addition, school and Department of Education officials and BIE education line officers identified several potential challenges that tribal groups might encounter, including not enough of the specialized knowledge required and funding, and an extensive time commitment that might not be sustainable given changes in leadership at both the tribal and BIE levels. The three tribal groups seeking alternatives reported a lack of federal guidance on the alternative development process and frustration with the pace and quality of communication with BIE. But they have more recently reported receiving some assistance from BIE and education. BIE's education line officers, who are the tribal group's primary contact for information on developing an alternative, generally indicated they had not received guidance or training on this provision. In communicating with tribal groups regarding alternative AYP definitions, BIE did not consistently apply its processes for providing accurate and timely responses. In our June 2008 report, we made recommendations to the Secretary of the Interior related to BIEs ensuring access to state assessments, guidance and training on the process for seeking alternatives, and communication with tribal groups seeking alternative definitions of AYP by establishing internal timeframes and processes. Interior agreed with our recommendations and reported taking actions in response to them. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared statement. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. And we'll look forward to the question. Um, Dr. Gilbert. Thank you, Chairman Kildee, and for championing on behalf of Native children, and thank you for your support, and we greatly appreciate it. My name is Dr. Willard Skyestawa Gilbert, President of the National Indian Education Association, and I'm also a member of the Hopi Tribe. Today, I'd like to share NIEA's membership's concerns regarding the disparity in academic achievement between school funding operated by BIE and other schools. 
n i a has held twelve field hearings on reauthorization and c l b a and recently conducted four of its five regional hearings on issues that impact native students who attend b i a funded schools well over two hundred witnesses had testified and had submitted written testimony regarding challenges our native students have encountered by n c l b a school transportation construction maintenance and facilities needs as well as j o m and tribal education department funding and other pressing issues the following is a summary of their testimony there is little collaboration between the departments of education and interior in helping b i a students meet requirements of n c l b for the past three years only thirty percent of b i a schools made a y p goals established by the states in which the goals were located in two thousand four the executive order was signed that directed the two departments to work together to assist american indian alaska native students in meeting the challenging students academic standards of n c l b act of two thousand one in a manner that is consistent with tribal traditions languages and cultures n i a encourages a stronger relationship between the two departments given the limited capacity a BIE and a larger pool of expertise in education and increase in academic achievement that is available at the Department of Education. In particular, NIA would like for the Department of Education to serve as technical advisors to the BIE regional and education line officers when the expertise is not available at the BIE on how to improve academic achievement and in the development of tribal standards and assessments that are culturally and linguistically appropriate. BIE should strongly support culturally based education and native language instruction. Current research demonstrates that cultural education can be successfully integrated into the classroom in a matter that would provide native students with instruction in the core subject areas based upon cultural values and beliefs. NIA proposed amendments to Title VII provide for more emphasis on meeting the unique cultural, language, and educational needs of Indian students through enrichment programs that supplement other NCLB programs and will result in successful academic achievement of Indian students. As reported by the National Indian Education Study of 07 Part 2, BIE students are receiving some exposure instruction in native language and cultural topics. NIA believes that these schools would be models for successful integration of native language immersion programs and culturally based education if given the opportunity, support, and resources needed to implement these types of programs that have demonstrated academic success. The lack of new construction and the poor facilities maintenance of BIA schools negatively impact the achievement of BIE students. In March of 2008, the Consensus Building Initiative issued a report that stated in their findings of the conditions of BIA schools that many schools are ill-equipped for the information age and aging or poor design may lead to a substandard educational environment. Operation and maintenance needs are not matched by operation and maintenance annual funding. And overall overcrowding is a major concern and a source of accelerating physical decline. On the average, BIA education buildings are 60 years old, while 40 years is the average age for public schools serving the general population. As shared by the Hopi tribe chairman, Students are at extremely high risk because of exposure to hazardous materials in their school facilities. In recent years, they have experienced severe reductions in annual appropriations for the building operations, maintenance, and repairs program, which then results in the ever-increasing number of projects placed in the facilities maintenance inventory system. While waiting for funding, Hopi students and staff were subjected to exposure to hazardous materials. About all the schools have asbestos and random issues, radon issues, which puts the students and staff at risk. The research on school building conditions and student outcomes finds a consistent relationship between poor facilities and poor performance. A recent study has shown that students attending school in newer, better facilities score five to 17 points higher on standardized tests than those attending in standardized bu uh, substandard buildings. It is unjust to expect our students to succeed academically if we fail to provide them with a proper learning environment to achieve s to be successful. Uh, as reported by the witness of regional hearings in South Dakota, Little Wounded Nisk, located on Pine Ridge Reservation, runs 13 bus routes every day, traveling an average of 1,575 miles uh, per school day, totaling 267, 715 miles annually. In conclusion, NIEA is committed to accountability, high standards, and rigorous education. And I would like to leave the uh, uh, like to uh, leave uh, one word with you, and that is, this is a testimony given by a, a third grader, Samantha Totochini Navajo, and she says, "Good afternoon. 
My name is Samantha Totocini. I am near the Water Clan. I go to school at Black Mesa Community School. During the winter, when it rains, the road gets muddy. The bus driver always tries to stay on the road, but we always slide off the road. This, par this past winter was terrible. I live across the wash. The bus couldn't get across the wash to pick us up. So me and my two sisters had a walk about a mile to meet the bus. I was crossing the wash when I lost both sides of my shoes in the mud. The bus driver and my sister helped me cross the wash and tried to find my shoes. Uh, also, uh, Chairman, I for the record, we would like to submit our transcripts from the testimonies and also our NCLB amendments. Thank you. Without objection, it will be included in the record. Thank you. Um, Anne Dudrow. Oh, oh, pardon me. Sorry. Wait, Anne. <laughs> Stan Holder, Stanley Holder. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Stan Holder. I'm the Chief of the Division of Performance and Accountability for the Bureau of Indian Education in the Department of Interior. I'm pleased to be here to speak on behalf of the Department concerning the recent GAO report entitled Bureau of Indian Education Schools Improving Interior's Assistance Would Help Some Tribal Groups Implement Academic Accountability Systems. The Division of Performance and Accountability acts as the state educational agency for the Bureau of Indian Education. As such, the division is responsible for oversight and supervision for 184 instructional and residential programs in 23 states. 59 of the programs are operated by the BIE and 125 are tribally operated under the provisions of Public Law 107.110 and Public Law 93.638. The GAO report states accurately that BIE has attempted to negotiate MOUs with all 23 states to facilitate the assessment process. This process is mandated by the final rule for implementation of No Child Left Behind. To date, BIE has been successful in acquiring 11 MOUs with states that have BIE instructional programs. BIE shares the GAO's concern for gaining MOUs with the 12 remaining states. BIE has encountered varying responses from the states that range from silence to unreasonable conditions. Two states that have presented unique barriers are California and New Mexico. California's initial response to the BIE's proposal to establish an MOU contained the requirement for a $1 million bond to be put in place to ensure test item security. Negotiations were stagnant until two months ago with, when, with the assistance of the Department of Education, dialogue was reestablished with the California Office of Assessment. BIE would like to achieve a reasonable agreement and have an MOU in place in the not too distant, in too distant future. The state of New Mexico initially agreed to and signed an MOU with BIE. Shortly thereafter, New Mexico rescinded the MOU and insisted that BIE consult with the New Mexico tribes to establish an MOU with the state. This presents an issue since BIE is required to utilize New Mexico's assessment process under the final rule. The final rule was the result of negotiated rulemaking, which is supposed to be the highest form of consultation. The GAO report also addresses some of the issues encountered in BIE's effort to provide technical assistance to tribally controlled schools that have requested alternate AYP uh, progress definition waivers. To date, there have been three such requests. The three requests are from the Navajo Nation, the Miccosukee Tribe of Florida, and the Ocheti Sakawea Education Consortium, or OSEC, uh, which is made up of 17 tribally operated schools in North and South Dakota. The BIE and representatives of the Department of Education met with the Navajo Nation with days, within days of the nation's initial request. The BIE has also provided technical assistance to the Navajo Nation via a contractor. BIE has not received additional correspondence or requests from the Navajo Nation or the Diné Department of Education that acts on behalf of the Navajo Nation. The BIE and the Department of Education have had various meetings and site visits with the Miccosukee Tribal School, tribal elected officials, and their tribal attorneys. The BIE and the Department of Education have provided technical assistance to the tribe via site visits and through a contractor. The most recent communication that we received from the tribe was a call from the Miccosukee Tribal Schools Administrator stating that the school and the tribe did not require any further technical assistance from the BIE. BIE staff have traveled to South Dakota to meet with the Ocheti Sakawea Consortium representatives beginning in 2005 to assist OSEC in developing their initial request for an alternate AYP definition waiver. The BIE and the Department of Education have met with OSEC representatives to explain and provide technical assistance on the waiver request process and the peer review process for establishing an alternate assessment. 
BIE has also provided technical assistance to OSEC through a contractor. Most recently, the BIE transferred funds to OSEC's fiscal agent for the purpose of initiating development of a Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota language assessment process to carry out the community activities and meetings necessary to develop that assessment and to carry out legal research on proposed changes to the BIE accountability workbook in an effort to expedite that process. The BIE is addressing the four recommendations made in the GAO report, which is stated in my written testimony. In closing, I would like to state that the education of Indian children is critical to improving the quality of life of Indian communities. Assessments and resulting AYP determinations are valuable measures used to determine the quality of instruction in the classroom. These measures provide administrators and teachers the opportunity to improve instruction so that students can achieve academic success. NCLB has provided a framework and goals for all students to be proficient in math and reading by 2014. Indian students in BIE and public schools face unique challenges. Poverty, loss of identity, and isolated communities are but a few of these challenges. However, our children will compete for employment, post-secondary education opportunities, and career opportunities on a global scale. It's all of our responsibility to ensure that they are prepared to meet these challenges. I thank you for the opportunity to appear here today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony, and uh, Ms. Dudrow. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Kilby, Ranking Member Castle, and all the members of the subcommittee for inviting the U.S. Department of Education to share with you what we're doing to improve the education of Indian children and, and provide technical assistance to tribal schools. My name is Ann Dudrow. I am the Chief of Staff for the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, and I'm pleased to be here today to speak on behalf of the Department about the recent GAO report entitled Bureau of Indian Education Schools, Improving Interiors Assistance would help some tribal groups implement academic accountability systems. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act, as amended and reauthorized by No Child Left Behind of 2001, provides federal aid for disadvantaged students to state and local education agencies, as well as the Bureau of Indian Education. Specifically, there are several requirements to which states and the BIE receiving Title I funds must adhere. They are, develop academic content and student achievement standards, measure student proficiency in reading, math, and science with assessments aligned with these standards, and determine whether schools are making adequate yearly progress with the goal that all students will meet or exceed the state's proficient level of academic achievement in reading and mathematics by 2014. The SCA requires the Secretary of the Interior to adopt a definition of AYP and use it to make accountability determinations for all BIE-funded schools. In 2005, after negotiated rulemaking, the Department of the Interior published a final rule establishing the definition of AYP for BIE-funded schools as the definition of AYP used by the state in which a BIE-funded school is located. However, in recognition of the sovereign nation of tribes, the SEA allows the governing body or school board of a BIE-funded school to apply for a waiver from all or part of a state's definition of AYP and propose an alternative de definition. Such alternatives are subject to the approval of the Secretaries of Interior and Education. In February of 2007, the two agencies signed an agreement to establish basic procedures for the review and approval of any alternative definitions of AYP submitted to the Interior by BIE-funded schools. Over the past year, the Department of Education has worked with BIE to provide technical assistance to three tribal groups that have requested alternatives to state AYP definitions, particularly in the form of developing new standards and assessment that include components of Native culture. On August 23rd of 2007, GAO held an entrance conference with the department. At that time, the department had not been informed of any tribal requests for technical assistance related to alternative definitions. On September 6th of the same year, the department was subsequently informed of the requests of the Miccosukee tribe and a consortium of the Dakota tribes, the OSEC. Upon receiving the formal request from Miccosukee, and after follow-up conversations with the BIE, three staff persons from the department traveled to the Miccosukee Reservation in Florida on November 20th to provide technical assistance. Nine days later, the department staff participated in a similar meeting in Rapid City, South Dakota, to provide technical assistance to the OSEC. Upon the conclusion of these two meetings, the department contact, contracted with an external expert who is a former assessment director for a state educational agency to provide additional technical assistance to both tribal groups. 
Shortly thereafter, on December 5th, the department was also informed of, re of a request from the Navajo Nation for technical assistance during a Title I monitoring visit to Albuquerque. On March 6th, the department staff and a contractor participated in a technical assistant meeting with the Navajo tribe in New Mexico. The Navajo meeting focused on a conceptual framework for their assessment and accountability systems. We have received no additional communication regarding any subsequent meetings. The request from the OSEC and the Navajo nations for alternatives to state definitions of adequate yearly progress include consideration of both an accountability component and a standards and assessment component, while the request from the Miccosukee focuses solely on the development and implementation of new assessments. There are seven requirements as outlined in statute and regulation and further elaborated in the Department's Standards and Assessment Peer Review Guide, first published in April of 2004 and then updated again in 2007. They are, one, to develop academic content standards that, specific, that specify what all students are expected to know and demonstrate in reading, language arts, mathematics, and science. Two, develop academic achievement standards that are aligned with the state or tribe's academic content standards. Three, use a single assessment system for all students. Four, demonstrate that the assessments meet standards for technical quality, including that they are valid and reliable measures of student knowledge. Five, demonstrate that the assessments are aligned with the state or tribe's content standards. Six, provide for the inclusion of all students, inclu including students with disabilities, in the state or tribe's assessment system. And seven, produce reports at the individual, student, school, LEA, and SEA levels. After an assessment system is fully developed, it must be presented to the Department of Education for peer review. The peer review determines if the organization, whether a state or tribe, adheres to the standards for assessment development as outlined in the guidance. In this manner, the department ensures that tests are valid and reliable for the purposes for which they are designed. To conclude, the department has been working with our colleagues at the BIE to respond, respond in a timely manner to the requests we have received for technical assistance from the tribes. Department staff, once made aware of any requests, has met with the tribes to discuss the issues and provide initial technical service. Furthermore, the department has provided for and will continue to provide and pay for additional technical assistance through a contractor to help the BIE and tribes. We take our responsibility to help ensure a high quality education for all Indian children very seriously. We also have a responsibility to guarantee that all schools that receive federal education funding abide by the applicable statutes and regulations. We are doing all that we can to support our colleagues at the BIE to meet the needs of the tribes, BIE funded schools, and American Indian students. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Chairman Kildee, uh, Ranking Member Castle, uh, members of the committee for inviting me to testify today. I want to thank um, Representative Hersa Sandlin for the introduction. It was quite nice, and for her leadership, both uh, here in Washington, D.C., on behalf of our, our state and, uh, and in South Dakota. I'm the Executive Director of the Ocheti Shikoyan Education Consortium, and my name is Ted Hamilton. The consortium is um, made up of currently 14 tribal schools, four tribal colleges in South and North Dakota, and provides a wide range of services, as uh, Representative Hersha Sandlin uh, explained. In the past eight years, OSEC staff have provided services to schools at the request of school superintendents and principals through a cooperative-like structure. Unlike a traditional educational cooperative model, OSEC maintains a school needs-based model that creates annually contracted projects specifically developed for each school's needs. This process provides a clear picture of the needs of the schools in our higher education process. I want to stress that OSEC is not an advocacy or representative organization. The schools that are our members own us, and we believe that our school boards and the tribal education departments should be heard in policy-level discussions. We do, as an organization, provide technical support as requested relating to policy level decisions. I have been asked today to discuss the work of our organization uh, related to the creation of a, of a definition of adequate early progress for some of our schools and our reaction to the GAO studies. And I've also been asked to make some comments on some other issues related to our membership. I've handed in a fairly thick written testimony and I'll refer to that as I go through this. Um, Related to No Child Left Behind uh, and the GAO report, 
Uh, the GAO report is a good case to point out some more general difficulties our schools are having with the BIE system. Uh, when NCLB was authorized, there was a process defining, uh, defined in the act um, called no negotiated rulemaking. And in the negotiated rulemaking, members uh, of the committee were assured that the tribes would be provided support, both technical and fiscal, and development of alternative assessments and standards. As an in interim steps, uh, schools would follow the accountability workbook of the states in which they reside. Two of the members of the negotiated rulemaking committee, Dr. Roger Bordeaux of Teos Prezina Tribal School and Deb Bordeaux of Loneman School, argued against the use of state workbooks and their associated standards, and finally, finally reluctantly agreed to the state standards and assessments provisions. When they came home in 2002, uh, eight, we had a meeting and eight of the schools decided they would pursue an alternative definition by pooling some resources. OSEC was asked to manage the process and to act as a single point of contact with the Bureau in the project. I'm attaching to my um, testimony an appendix of the timeline of our work. So we've been doing this now since for the last four years. Uh, it's been going on for a while. Our first attempts to get this work done, we were told repeatedly by the Bureau that we, would not, we could not apply as a group of schools for an alternative definition. We were told it would be too expensive and that there was no money for this type of work. Well, we were required to have our school boards pass multiple resolutions agreeing to work together through the OSEC organizational structure, and we generally did not receive any correspondence from the Bureau other than letters telling us that, we did not, not, that they did not have to help us. Uh, in reading the No Child Left Behind Act, tribes and tribal schools that wish to waive the state definitions for their own definition are required to submit an alternative definition within 60 days of alerting the Secretary of Interior of their intent to waive NCLB requirements. The Secretary of Interior is then required to give a written response either supporting or denying the waiver. This allows a tribe or tribes to begin negotiation process with Interior. After four submissions beginning in 2005, the OSEC schools finally received their first written response to their proposed definition in August of 2008. A significant aspect of developing an alternative definition is the creation of educational standards and assessment tools. Uh, at the core of our concern about using state AYP definitions is a lack of culturally appropriate content standards. On page five of the testimony, I, I quote the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations, which requires uh, the use of um, content standards, or that content standards used in schools be culturally appropriate and that uh, the primary native language of the school population be assessed annually. The state of South Dakota doesn't... Um, develops educational standards to meet those regulations and is not bound by those regulations. Um, our organization has repeatedly asked for funding to develop assessment instructions for the standards we've created. We met with BIE and DOI officials in late November of 2007. We're told funding would be available for assessment development. We were told to con conduct a bidding process with companies for assessment development, create a plan and submit that plan. It was the third time we had completed that process. We also submitted our third accountability workbook for approval at that time. To help us, we were assigned a consultant from the Department of Education that was referenced before, Mr. J.P. Bodine. Uh, Mr. Bodine helped us review the bids we received and helped us create a final budget that we submitted on March 4th of 2008. The um, long and the short of it was we found out today, actually, Mr. Holder told me today that the Bureau was going to provide us some resources. For the Native American uh, portion of this, we haven't received any dollars um, uh, for the rest of the assessment. In, our, in the testimony, I go on to talk about the Bureau's work with us and the number of problems we have. On page 8, we talk about some problems that we've had with determining adequate early progress, telling parents if their schools are succeeding or not. We have not, we've yet to have a year where we've met the deadline to let parents know that their schools are succeeding or not. Uh, and this year we'll once again miss that deadline if we follow the Bureau's plan. Um, we have also have real questions about the Bureau acting as an SEA for our schools. A state education agency uh, should be, and in our reading of the Indian Education Act, should be in the, the role of the Indian uh, Tribal Controlled um, Education Departments. It should not be, uh, if we're going to continue to maintain government to government relationships uh, between the Bureau of Indian Education and the Department of Education. I feel it, and we feel that it's a, a violation of the government to government relationship to have the Bureau acting as an SEA for the tribes. In conclusion, because I see my little red light here, um, I want to I wanna say one thing, and it's, it's a message from two people. One is um, Lionel Bordeaux, the president of Sinte Glashka University, who you, Mr. Kildee, know. And the other one is from my wife, who is our artist Ironcloud.
And when we have th three sovereignties, we also, uh, most of us up here, looking around up here, have two citizenships. Probably most of you but down at the witness table have three real citizenships. I am a citizen of the United States. Very proud of that citizenship. I'm a citizen of Michigan, and I have obligations, responsibilities, and rights that flow from both those citizenships. And that's it. I have two citizenships. My Chippewa and my Potawatomi, my Indian tribes, those members, citizens, have three citizenships. And they have rights and responsibilities that flow from all three of those citizenships. We know, for example, the Indians have proven their US citizenship time and time again because a larger percentage of Native Americans have served in our armed forces than any other group. They're citizens and good citizens of the state of Michigan and contribute a great deal, by the way, to the state treasury. And then they are citizens of their sovereign tribes. So those are the realities that the law has to work around. And whenever we, we enact a law, we cannot ignore the Constitution. And that's why very often we, we get into some of these uh, uh, contacts between these three sovereignties. And it might create some uh, difficulties, but they are difficulties that are based upon the Constitution itself. So I appreciate you know, all of you struggling with this, defending your sovereignty, and recognizing the sovereignty when you deal with the Indian tribes. It's ex extremely important. And that's true on the state level. You know, uh, most, I, I think all the schools really pretty well accept the AYP program of, of the states. But the state, when it has these Indian schools, is required to sit down in good faith and talk to the Indian schools, the Indian leaders, in good faith and try to work out what standards and testing and AYP will be on the state level. That's a requirement. And then when the uh, Secretary of, of, um, of the Interior uh, is looking for alternatives to that, uh, he or she has the obligation to sit, to sit down, sovereign to sovereign, one not more equal than the others. You, know, you can't be more equal. You're either equal or not equal, right? Sit down and, and, and discuss and try to, try to find some common agreement. And that takes patience. When we negotiate with France, that takes patience. When we uh, negotiate with the Russian Federation, that, that takes patience. But I think we have to recognize that we sit down that that person, the other side of the table, is, oh gosh, we got more work to do. These Indians want something. No, these sovereigns want something. <coughs> and that sovereignty is guaranteed by the US Constitution. I think that's the attitude that we have to take in. Then perhaps we can make some progress. And it won't always be easy when you have to recognize the other side has an equal voice at that, at that table. And you have to reach agreement, and not an imposed agreement. When you get a memorandum of understanding, it can't be something that's handed to say, this is, this is our understanding, right? It's a memorandum of understanding based upon mutual agreement. That's very important. So the Indians have the obligation to protect their sovereignty, those who are not representing the Indian tribes directly have an obligation to recognize that and, and, and uh, address the matter in that fashion. Um, let me ask this, that's my, my sermon today, but I, I spent some time in a seminary, so I do preach a bit at times, but I, but I believe that very strongly. Uh, let me just start, I'll throw the question out I'll throw it out to uh, the uh, GAO first. In general, what would you say is the most significant obstacle in tribal, federal, and tribal state relations? 
than any of you may. All right. Uh, well, from the work we did, uh, with regard to tribal state, I'll take that first because that's a little bit easier. <laughs> it's negotiation of the memorandums of understanding, the MOUs. Uh, there are MOUs currently with 11 of the 23 states in which the BIE schools are located. For the other 12 states, those MOUs have not been developed. Uh, to date, except for California, uh, the tribal schools have had access to the assessments and standards and the scoring in, in all, all the states. But without an agreement, some type of contract, there is no guarantee that they will continue to have access or they will continue to have access under the same conditions. So it, it puts the tribal schools at risk because if they don't have access to assessments, of course the whole, that's the whole basis or the base for the accountability system under No Child Left Behind. California, of course, has not granted access uh, because of its concern about security and that needs to be worked out and that uh, has not been worked out as, as I understand it to date. So that, that's a major problem. Uh, with regard to the, the tribal groups and the BIE, uh, this only was a, a rocky start in terms of um, providing assistance and responding to requests for assistance or just requests to you know, maybe brainstorm sometimes. I mean, generally, if in the early uh, years, it wasn't necessarily a, an official request for assistance as much as the tribal groups needing to know what they would have to do to, to get assistance to carry out their waivers or what they might do in terms of um, alternative assessments. And, and they apparently did not get the degree of assistance and the response that uh, they needed. Things have improved, uh, as we said uh, in our statement and uh, in the report. Uh, beginning last fall and continuing into this year, there have been meetings between BIE education and the three, three tribal groups who have officially sought waivers or sought to, be pro to begin the process for seeking waivers. Uh, so things seem to be on a better footing. But uh, as you said in, in your statement, uh, what is need is more communication, better communication, continued responsiveness, and sincerity on all sides so that obstacles can be addressed and agreements can be worked out. Thank you very much. Mr. Gilbert, do you have a comment? Uh, Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I do have a comment, and that has to do with assessment. Uh, the, one of the main reasons why we're here today, again, like you said, is to address those particular issues that deal with our, our children and our educational system. Uh, our concern has always been uh, with the idea of uh, state and tribal relationships, uh, everywhere from assessment, accountability, AYP and so forth. But one of the things that we struggle with is, uh, is the idea of assessment. Uh, one fit, excuse me, one test doesn't fit all. And when you talk about culturally and linguistically inappropriate exams for our children, uh, that's one of the reasons why our children perhaps aren't doing well on these exams. Something that we need to take a look at, but not only that, but also to work closely with our state education agencies to collaborate with one another to come up with some other types of assessment techniques besides just one test. Uh, for example, uh, uh, exams that may be portfolio assessments and so others that uh, provide that avenue of how we can better assess our children and our growth of our children. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holder. Uh, needless to say, managing 23 accountability systems is, is no easy task for the Bureau of Indian Education. Uh, also, some of the resistance that we've encountered with the states as far as developing the MOUs to ensure our access to their accountability systems and to be able to administer the, the test and receive the scores uh, has been a challenge. Um, I believe that in the 20 years that I've been around Indian education, there has been significant discussion on developing uh, tribal standards or, or Indian standards for our students. Uh, no Child Left Behind is the statutory framework that, that the BIE follows as far as managing programs, as far as state accountability is concerned, and there is the provision for tribes to request an alternate AYP definition that's contained in the statute. 
uh, we, we follow the statute and support the statute. That's, that's our position. We partner with the Department of Education to achieve that end. And, and I have pursued this and very aggressively um, since I was placed back in my position as the chief of the division. And we'll continue to do so. Our ultimate goal, and I've expressed this to Mr. Hamilton, is to, to get an assessment on the ground to, to be able to move forward with this. We are concerned, though, that, that we're developing uh, a prototype. We're, we're venturing into unknown territory. So we want to make sure, to the best of our ability, that, that we're following the statute, that we're, we're doing things in the best interest of Indian students. Uh, that's why we're partnering with the Department of Education to, to provide this technical assistance. And we will continue to do so in the future. Thank you. Yes. And the only thing I would add, in addition to what Ms. Tolliver just said, is that certainly our agency recognizes the authority and the right of the tribes to ask for an additional um, alternative AYP definition. Um, but we acknowledge that the development of a standards and assessment system is not an easy process. And we still have states, very large states, such as California, that are still struggling with developing their own system. Um, we have provided, we'll continue to provide TA with our staff and our consultant, but we do look to our colleagues at BIE to work with the tribes to help expedite this process. As noted in the GAO report, this process can be rather lengthy, taking anywhere from one to three years. Um, and we want to do everything in our ability to follow what is in the statute and provide BIE schools and the tribes with technical assistance they need in order to develop their own definition of AYP. Uh, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Kildee, I was, as a person who believes in spirits, I think you were channeling some people from our uh, meetings uh, in your discussion prior to this because a lot of things you said about sovereignty are the things that we talk about uh, on a daily basis where we live. And when you asked the question, what struck me was the uh, relationship between the Bureau of Indian Education and the tribal education departments and um, the tribal schools. And what we're seeing in, increasingly is the tail wagging the dog. Um, in Indian education, we fund our schools through um, ICEP money primarily, and No Child Left Behind is kind of 18 to 20 percent of our budget. And yes, yet it's taking up the bulk of our time. And what's happening is, is we're seeing that the Bureau of Indian Education is using it to increase its it's gro growing its infrastructure, growing its bureaucracy, and growing an oversight that's pretty much unnecessary. Um, and it's because of that idea. The issue is, what is that level of respect? Are we respecting the government-to-government -government relationship between the tribal schools, the tribal councils, and the federal government? Um, we have taken to court, and won in court, um, issues around the MOUs uh, when the Bureau came to us and said, we're restructuring. They put into a consultation, uh, what they called a consultation, a uh, package that said, you're going to restructure the Bureau and you're going to have this MOU. And we took it to court and the judge said, you didn't even do proper consultation. This, and yet the Bureau moves forward, referring to themselves. And it's in the written testimony here about being this, the 51st state. And one of the things that is deeply concerning to me is this concept that we can treat Native Americans as the 51st state, as, um, as we've heard in the past, this concept of pan-Indians, that all Native American tribes are the same. Um, as you said, each tribe and each treaty defines a sovereignty. The challenge to me is that we have hundreds of sovereignties out there, and that the sovereignty that my son and my wife have through their relationship with the Ogala Sioux tribe is different than the sovereignty that one of my nephews have because he's a member of the Navajo tribe. And those are two completely different sovereignties. It's not that he's Native American. It's that Arlo is a Navajo. And when he talks, he talks about growing up in a Hogan with his grandparents and they eat sheep there. Um, we don't in South Dakota, we eat beef. And uh, that's a plug for the beef industry. <laughs> but. Um, there are differences, and I think this, as you say, is a simple issue, but it's a critical issue at defining the starting point. Where do we start with educating our children and maintaining a culture and maintaining a community and maintaining a way of life? And if everybody is treated the same, 
then we've lost the battle to begin with. There's nothing so unequal as treating unequals equally. And each of the tribes is its own sovereign nation. And when we look at what's gone on here, what we're seeing is a homogenization of Native American peoples. And this issue that we have is just the iceberg. We can talk about meeting this requirement or meeting that requirement, but at the core of it is how have you assured not only this subcommittee, but the, but the government itself assured that each tribe has a way of saying this is what's important for us, for our children to learn. Thank you very much. And now, I now yield a generous time to the ranking a member of the committee, <laughs> Governor Castle. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I don't believe that I have the knowledge of the chairman in terms of all these issues. So some of my questions are more informational, developing what is the issue and the problem as opposed to answers at, at this point. And let me start with you, Mr. Holder. Perhaps uh, Dr. Gilbert could help with this, perhaps others. Uh, you stated in your written testimony um, that less than 10% uh, of all American Indian children in the United States attend BIE-funded schools. Um, and I think it's about 44,000 uh, total. M my uh, question is, why is that? I, th I think I know the answer to these things, but I'm not sure. I'd like to hear from you. Why is that? I assume it's uh, disbursement of the population, people not living in areas where the schools are available. Uh, but perhaps there's a matter of choosing which schools one wants to go to, too. And I was just curious as to what the explanation uh, for the, that percentage is. Right. The, the Bureau of Indian Affairs schools were put in place historically uh, on reservations, and I believe that off-reservation boarding programs were also established in the early part of the century some dating back uh, to the 1870s. Um, as time evolved and communities began to grow in these particular areas, okay. the Bureau of Schools continued to provide educational services to those populations. However, public schools have also been established on the reservations, and it is a matter of choice uh, for the students as to what school that they choose to attend, the Bureau operated school or the public school. Uh, we, we operate uh, and, and maintain as close communication as we can with the public schools also because we have mobility of students between those schools. But the, the answer to your question is actually lies in the, the history of the development of bureau schools and educational systems on reservations and adjacent Indian communities. What might be the uh, reason, um, and this is just conjecture, I understand that, but what might be the reason that a child might choose uh, a public school versus a BIE school? Uh, might the parents be interested in the, in the cultural development they might get at the BIE school, or is it just a question of proximity for the most part? Uh, what, what is the, the motivating force to keep these going as they are? I, I believe there's, there's always a diversity of reasons for students to choose to attend a particular school or for parents to choose to send their, their child to that particular school. Uh, in some cases, it is, it is proximity, such as on Pine Ridge. You have the Pine Ridge School that's operated by the Bureau of Indian Education that is a K through 12 program. Uh, most of the schools, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ted, I can't pull it off the top of my head, out in the, the districts are, are K-8 schools or K-6 schools, so when the students complete at those schools, they, they have very limited choices, either Little Wound School and Kyle or Pine Ridge, which are about 60 miles apart. Uh, in some cases, they're bused off reservation to uh, a small community called Oryx. So it depends on proximity to the, to the school, the availability of, of space and other factors involved in that. I believe that, that more and more uh, parents and, and students are choosing to attend schools that provide a substantial cultural program and that integrate culture and language into the curriculum. Yes, sir, Mr. Hamilton. If I may add something, um, I've raised nine kids on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Uh, my wife and I have nine. So we've had children go to bureau-operated schools, bureau-funded schools, state schools and parochial schools, which are our choices on that reservation. The state schools, my wife teaches at one of them, uh, spends about $4,000 more per child per year than the bureau-funded schools do. Uh, so there is an issue of resources. I walk into my wife's classroom, every child has a computer, every child has a music program accessible to them. There's a nice gymnasium, there's quite a, quite a nice setup there, brand new buildings. This is not the way it is at the, at the Bureau funded schools. Um, my oldest children have moved to Rapid City and their children attend a public school because of the unemployment 
realities of Pine Ridge. Um, they moved off reservation. And when we talk about the, the large number of children who go to public schools, many of them are there for economic reasons. Mom and dad have to have a job and they have to support their families. And like any family, they go where the jobs are. Um, it is, I don't know, we don't know if we have the right people here, but I know from the work that we do with the South Dakota Gear Up Grant, because it's one of the projects that we run, that over 60% of the uh, native children in the public school systems drop out. Um, that the success rate with native children in South Dakota um, in the public schools is just marginally better than in the, in the grant and the, the BIA funded and operated schools. There's not much difference statistically. We can play a little bit with numbers, but what it comes down to is that native kids are not doing well in the public schools. Lots of times they're there because that's where we can find work and that's where our families can find work. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Rapid City, uh, South Dakota with my grandchildren and I met with the uh, superintendent of schools there and said I'm concerned because my grandson has a 5% chance of graduating from high school in Rapid City schools right now because in Rapid City there's a 95% dropout rate amongst native boys. I'm looking for a brief answer on, on, on this. I was trying to ask a question of Ms. Ashby if I can get to it, but uh, just as a follow-up, um, you know, uh, we have uh, Nanticoke Indians in, in Delaware and they all speak English as well or better than, than I do, all of you do as, as well. And my question is, is English as a, as a second language an issue in any of the tribal circumstances we have in, in this country today? I'd, I'd like to respond to that simply because we've carried out a reading first program uh, that, that deals uh, primarily with the development of language vocabulary and ultimately reading skills. What we've experienced is that the tribal students that speak the tribal language as a first language have a much easier time gaining the skills to read in English. That, that something that confounds the process is the third language that often develops in tribal communities or ethnic communities where um, the, the tribal or ethnic language isn't spoken as a pure language. Uh, so there is that interference with the, the progression of the process associated with reading simply because uh, decoding phonemic awareness and phonics are, are pretty much distorted by, by that spoken language. So the establishing the tribal language, we have one school, Luca Chukai, in, in Arizona that initiated an early childhood immersion project back in 2002. Uh, the first cohort of students uh, were assessed by the Arizona State Assessment uh, last year and the school made adequate yearly progress. So we see the benefits of, of establishing a pure tribal dialect and then building la English upon that dialect. Thank you. Dr. <laughs> if I may, um, immersion programs uh, on Indian reservations have become very successful. Uh, and one of the th issues that we are concerned about is not only language, but also a culture as well. So we believe that if a child, if we can start a child at a very young age in an immersion program where they're speaking and learning about their language and their culture from K grade to third grade, for example, and they're immersed in their culture and so forth, then by the time they graduate from high school, not only will they be bilingual, but they will also, in some cases, maybe trilingual but also they will achieve academic performance from K to 12th grade because based upon uh, Mr. Holder's uh, comments is that it, it is correct and say that results of exams of children who are in immersion programs perform better than children who are not in immersion programs. So we know that for a fact. Uh, and the other issue I would like to just briefly mention is that uh, if a child learns their first language at a very young age, and then that transition into learning a second language becomes much easier for them because the skills that they use in learning their first language, they'll pick up the English language very quickly or another language, whatever language that may be. So, thank you. Thank you. Can I ask Ms. Ashby? Yeah, sure. Yeah, j just briefly, I know my time is up, but I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Ashby sort of a complicated question that I'll try to simplify. Um, and uh, you, you stated in your, your testimony that uh, only a third of the BIE schools actually make uh, AYP. Um, did, 
in, in your, did that study or in your studies, uh, have you identified uh, what schools that have made AYP, BIE schools that made AYP, have done differently or, or what specific efforts they have made to reach uh, the AYP? Uh, in other words, uh, is there some way we, we can help by defining that? No, I'm sorry, we have not done that. Uh, that certainly would be an interesting study and a useful one, I think, but that's not something that was in the scope of the work we did. I mean, I, just as a final comment, um, I, I know in, in Delaware it, it's very interesting to, for me to go to school to school, and I find that some schools are really focused on what it is that, that they can do. And, uh, and their neighbor's school, maybe five miles away, has not, and they haven't done anywhere near as well. And the schools that have uh, have done remarkably well. It's, 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 it's a worthwhile subject matter, I think. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you ask a very good question. We used to have what's called the National Diffusion Network where you could find out why certain schools were succeeding. It would be very interesting if we looked at that one-third who were reaching AYP and see what we can learn from them that might be transferable to the other schools. So perhaps that's something we can all explore. Uh, now it's my pleasure to call upon uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Woolsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for Thanks this interesting hearing and all the interesting witnesses. Uh, I took plenty education of is <laughs> the future of our country. It's uh, the future of every single child, that's uh, every student, and certainly it's the future of sovereign Indian nations. Uh, and you know, Indian education was here before AYP and No Child Left Behind. So uh, I'm wondering, and I feel certain that you have some statistics, or at least you have a general sense of the difference between graduation rates uh, between BIE schools and public schools or uh, parochial schools, uh, that you know what percentage of, of uh, BIE educated kids go to community colleges or four-year colleges, and what are their careers when they're through with the school system, and how does it compare to the public education system? Because it's all about what's best for those those students. So, uh, would anybody be willing to talk to me about that? Uh, and it's before AYP. It's uh, it's bigger than that, I think. So, uh, Ms. Ashby, did do you guys have any? Do you have any statistics on this? I I don't have any statistics on the top of my head. I I do know that in general. Uh, students in uh, BIE funded schools do poorly uh, on most things you would look at in terms of graduation rates, attendance rates, test scores. So there's definitely a problem. But I will say that in doing work for the report we issued in uh, June, as well as work on other reports we've issued involving uh, Indian students and work that's currently ongoing, and making site visits across the country. I have met uh, well-educated Indian adults in all professions that are highly capable and they seem like people everywhere else. <laughs> they go to school, some, some go to college at the tribal colleges and uh, going back into the 90s, I did some work on tribal colleges. Um, but many go to the same schools that everyone else goes to. They, they don't all go to tribal schools by any means, and they are accomplished as anybody else, as, well, as people. And, and isn't the goal to uh, be able to be an adult and raise their children in, so that their children have a future also? So but, but how, are we, how are we doing there? But, excuse me, having said that, I don't want to leave the impression that there aren't issues. There, there are lots of issues. And as with every ethnicity, there are people who do well and lots of people who don't do well. And our responsibility as a nation is to help those who need a helping hand. And with regard to Native Americans, Indians, that certainly is the case. Mr. Uh, Hamilton, if Ms. Dutra. I can get your email address or some one of your aides, I can send you a study we're f just finishing up that looks at test scores over the last three years between the tribal schools in South Dakota. Uh, it'll only give you South Dakota. It won't give you the nation. Um, but what we found is that 
um, in general, uh, in the public schools, public schools that are adjacent or on reservations do just about the same as um, in terms of test scores as the, uh, the BIA funded schools. Um, BIA operated schools don't do quite as well. Um, it's kind of harder to find their data, but we've been able to pull it up lately. Uh, the Bureau has started to add, to put stuff on their website so we can start looking at this stuff finally. Um, we are seeing a growth in Native students going to college. The Tribally Controlled College Act has had a huge impact on the number of Native people on their reservations going to college. We're not seeing um, that in the public sector. Uh, if you go to South Dakota, we have across our entire state about 12 to 14 percent of our population are Natives. That holds true for the student population. Actually, the student population is slightly larger because we have more Native kids than non-Native kids in the state. Well, that's not quite true. We have, we have about 18 percent in percentages. Um, we only had 125 incoming freshmen in the Board of Regents last year, uh, which is about 1 percent of the population. Um, the bulk of Native students go to tribal colleges out of high school. Um, so there's a, we've been using the South Dakota Gear Up grant um, monies. We run a program, actually, our consortium, in partnership with our state, where we, this year we have 380 students. And we have, of the kids coming in, after four years in that program, we have a 92% placement rate into college. Um, it's been a very successful program, but it's very difficult to maintain the funding for it. Uh, because we have to continually go and ask funding agents, how do we keep this thing going? And I know we've approached the Bureau to see if we can create a, 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 a stable flat funding for this every year because it's a really good program. Thank I mean, it you. speaks uh, to that. Mr. Chairman, can Ms. Dudrow answer? Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, certainly the one thing that I would add on behalf of the department, I cannot um, give you statistics off the top of my head is as well, but I could certainly supply you with the National Indian Education Studies Parts 1 and 2 that our department just funded over the last two years, which provide a tremendous amount of data. Um, and similar to what my other uh, panelists have told you, we do know that Indian students are not performing at the same rates as their counterparts, and, and certainly it, it's worse if you attend a BIE school. Uh, the National um, Education, uh, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the NAEP, has not historically sampled Indian education, Indian students at the same level. And so we've actually supported our agency has just supported an oversampling of Native American students. So in the last two years, in 05 and 07, we have more data on the performance of Native American students than we've ever had before. And as I mentioned, it's still not as good as its count their counterparts, but we have seen some progress in the last two years. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wilsey. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think some of the questions I had were answered, at least for South Dakota. Um, and Ms. Ashby, did you ascertain whether teacher salaries at the Indian schools were better or worse than the surrounding schools in the area? We did not. Did anybody, Mr. Allen, you said that the funding was higher actually in South Dakota. Bureau, Bureau operated schools use the, we believe it's called the Department of Defense pay scale. I'm not really sure where that pay scale comes from. Their teachers are paid uh, significantly higher. Bureau funded schools, the tribal grant schools, run about eight to $10,000, give or take a little bit less than the public schools. So there's, a, there's discrepancies in how resources are given out for teacher pay. Is that the same in other states, Mr. Gilbert? In our test, uh, in hearing our testimonies uh, on the re uh, Navajo Reservation, one of the concerns is that uh, uh, the issue of uh, pay for our uh, teachers on reservation schools is much lower than the public schools. The other issue having to do not only with pay but also with uh, maintaining our teachers on the reservation schools. I've heard stories where teachers uh, come to our reservations, teach for one year, and then leave half a year and leave one month and leave, one day and leave before they even get into the classroom. So this is a major concern for us because we have a major- Why, why is that? I'm sorry? Why? Well, because, because of the high turnover rates that we have not only in teachers but also administration as well. When you come to our reservations, for example, the closest uh, Sears Roebuck store is probably can be about at 200 miles away. So we don't have the facilities uh, and so forth that Flagstaff or Phoenix or whatever other big cities may have. 
Who pays for uh, school construction and equipment like computers and science labs and whatnot? Is that the uh, federal, state, and local? Who pays? Who puts the bill for that? The uh, Office of Facilities Construction and Management in the Bureau of Indian Affairs is responsible for school construction and school renovation projects. The so it's, a, uh, it's on the federal level. Right. Okay. Right. Um, Mr. Hamilton talked about um, dropouts in South Dakota. Uh, what is the graduation rate in other states, in the bureau schools and in the public schools? One of the challenges that we have in No Child Left Behind is that uh, we're sitting up uh, calculating uh, of those who take the test and are actually there and ignoring the fact that half of them didn't show up because they've dropped out and a school cannot possibly be given, should not be given credit for adequate yearly progress if half the students have dropped out. Um, South Dakota, apparently, a lot of people, a lot of them are dropping out, not graduating. Um, we need to get a, uh, get hold of what the dropout rate is. And uh, if, if, it, if we don't know, um, a strong attempt will be made to get a better dropout provision in the No Ch Child Left Behind when it's reauthorized. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Um, for, uh, for public and BIA schools, 49, the dropout rate is 49% males and 51% females. Uh, that's, the, that's the current percentages that uh, we have in regard to public and BIA school dropouts. Um, well, obviously some work needs to, um, needs to be done on, on, on that. I think it was uh, Mr. Holder indicated that some of the students feel I isolated in the public schools. Uh, what is uh, done for after school programs to make sure people or their children are engaged in their education? Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, did you indicate that students seem in public schools seem isolated, um, uh, not um, very much engaged in the um, education process? Well, I, I believe that uh, public schools, and not, not all public schools, I believe that New Mexico has a very strong Native American support program in their schools where they have a, a high density of, of Indian students. Uh, however, I believe that some Indian students do choose to go to bureau-operated schools or tribally-operated bureau-funded schools uh, to be in more, more close contact with their language and culture for the, the programs that they provide there at the schools. Is anything being done in after school programs, um, mentoring or other otherwise college access programs that Mr. Hamblin mentioned uh, gear up uh, upward bound to keep people in school and headed towards college rather than dropping out? We, we have two um, programs that are available in the Bureau. One is Title IV Part B, which is 21st Century Community Learning Centers. Uh, that provides an appropriation for before, after, and extended year programs to provide academic and behavioral support uh, to students. In addition to that, we, we procured uh, departmental funding through the Department of Interior to provide tutoring and mentoring grants uh, to schools to, to support students also. And how many people have taken advantage of it? Ms. Dutro, do you want to comment? Yes, I was just going to mention that the Department of Education through Title VII also has approximately $9.1 million for special programs for Indian education, including after-school programming and secondary, post-secondary education training. And how many students, what portion of the students take, uh, have access to those programs? Are you funding enough so that most of them can participate? I couldn't give you the percentage off the top of my head. If, if I may. Um, just Tam Hamilton and Mr. Gilbert. Just very, very quickly, uh, another after-school program that can be very successful, but unfortunately it seems always to be on the, uh, uh, the low totem pole in regard to funding is the GOM programs. Uh, GOM programs have become very successful in providing those opportunities for our students, uh, in particular after-school programs. And uh, what we have learned and what we have found in these programs is their students become very successful, not only academically, but also socially as well. We started to see um, attempts at creating uh, relationships between boys clubs and girls clubs, and which are kind of non-education programs formally and, and the bureau systems. Uh, we need more funding for that. One of the issues, at least where I live, is um, 
a transportation issue. You know, we all know about the price of gas. Um, that's exacerbated when your child has a uh, 50 to 60 mile, 100 mile, in the case of Navajo, 200 mile drive uh, from where the boys club is or boy, girls club to home. And a lot of those programs don't have transportation programs associated with them. Um, and so our schools are facing issues of saying, we'd like you to stay after school, we don't have enough resource to, to pay for you to drive back and forth. And in my community with an average um, household income of about $6,200 a year, maybe $6,300 a year, it gets pretty cashy pretty quick to drive your pickup truck uh, 50 miles to pick up your child and 50 miles back home at 14 miles per gallon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Scott, the gentleman uh, from uh, New Jersey, Mr. Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, calling for this important hearing and your interest <clears throat> for many, many years in this area. I wonder, uh, Ms. Ashby, uh, in your testimony, you described some actions that uh, BIE has taken in response to your recommendations. Can you discuss those and also what more needs to be done to ensure that tribal groups are aware of their options regarding accountability systems and uh, those that are interested in uh, pursuing them or able to pursue them? Uh, BIE has begun to address our recommendations. Uh, as I said earlier, since last fall in particular, there have been meetings with uh, the three tribal groups that are interested in seeking alternatives to the AYP definition. Uh, those meetings have been apparently somewhat fruitful. Uh, there is a consultant that uh, is working, and this may be a consultant, consultant financed by the Department of Education, I'm not sure which, or maybe it's working with both BIE and education. But there is now a consultant working with the tribal groups. Uh, there are plans to provide information on uh, how to seek alternatives at a conference coming up this fall. Uh, so there are things in the works, but certainly, as we often say at GAO, more needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, MOUs still have not been negotiated with uh, the other 12 states. Uh, California still is not allowing access, and there is no alternative been developed for the two tribes that are in, two tribal groups in, in uh, California, the two schools, rather, in California that need access to an assessment or need an assessment that's valid and reliable so that it can be accountable under No Child Left Behind. So, so that needs to be done um, quickly mm -hmm. because, as I said earlier, the schools are at risk of uh, having at least the conditions upon which they have access changed. So uh, there has been work, actions taken, but we, we hope to see continued action and ultimately the MOUs negotiated and uh, structures set up to provide timely responses to uh, any, any tribal group that's interested in seeking an alternative. Uh, what agency in the Department of Education is responsible for perhaps seeing that their, your recommendations are being moved forward more, more rapidly? Uh, I believe this comes under the, the Title I office. Mm -hmm. uh, at least uh, a good deal of the money is, is Title I money for low-income schools. And I'm not sure if there are other agencies as well. Well, maybe since we have someone from the Department of Education, maybe we'll make you the, the bad fella. Um, what, it, what are you all, uh, be, uh, what's happening in your, your enforcement or your encouragement of this moving forward? Sure. Um, as stated, GAO is correct. The Office of Elementary and Secondary Education when it oversees Title I is the primary office that is responsible for working with the BIE to ensure that uh, tribes have the opportunity to apply for an alternative to AYP definition. Uh, the department sponsors BIE at a little over $210 million annually, um, primarily one point, uh, $129 million approximately comes out of the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education, and the remaining funds comes from our Office of Special Education. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, written and oral, 
We have a memorandum of agreement with the Bureau of Indian Education to set up a process for helping BIE process through requests that they receive from the tribes. Um, and, and as stated in the GAO report, uh, we try to answer those uh, requests in the most timely manner. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, you know, you testified that many federal grants for assisting Indian students and teachers go to organizations that have little specific experience with Indian issues. Uh, can you um, expand on that? And also, you mentioned, uh, can you discuss the difficulties created when the AYP determinations are not made until well after the start of the school year and whether that situation has improved recently? Um, related to uh, contracts, grants going to organizations that don't have a, a history, or maybe they aren't have a history with us, I, I can think of two specific examples. Um, when Does Halliburton do this kind of close. stuff? Close. Um, <laughs> we won't go into that. Uh, we've been involved with some of those kind of things too, unfortunately. But um, we did have, uh, at one point, when I was working with the um, alt the restructuring at Wounded Knee District School. We were told by the Bureau that we would have a consultant come in and they took a $10 million chunk of money and paid for the University of Utah to provide uh, support in South Dakota, a uh, Nan Gutshaw, who came up one day, very nice lady, and was gone. Um, didn't see her again. We did a lot of work, but we didn't see her. And in fact, that was the only help that that school got directly from the Bureau in their restructuring process. Um, our organization has helped them um, the rest of the time. And um, recently, the Department of Education has a, has a grant process to train um, Native American principals. And my wife, who keeps coming up in my life, is actually in part of that master's program. And um, even though the tribal colleges put in for this program, um, they didn't, one, of the, one of the grants ended up at uh, Montana State University, which my wife is part of that cohort group and she's becoming a principal and she's yet to have a native instructor even though we have a large number of native americans with phds who could be teaching she has not been instructed on what it is to finance or run a bureau operated or bureau funded school it's been very much a public school preparation and we've had a lot of talks about that um, where there's there needs to be some oversight of saying how when we when we take large amounts of resource and we're going to help out the tribes making sure that the tribes have some sort of voice in what goes on with those. And those are just two of many examples. I could give you a list. Mm -hmm. um, the other, other part of your question, I've got to help refresh my mind here. My ADHD kicked in. So uh, what was the other half of your question there? Well, I had asked um, one about the consultants and, and secondly about when the AYP starts late in the system, the disability that it has to the kid. In in law, um, the Bureau is not obligated to provide school choice for parents. In reality, um, where I live, there are five different elementary schools vying for children. And parents move their children from place to place, depending on their perception of the health of a school. Uh, we were talking earlier about why kids go to specific schools. And parents do pay attention. Um, NCLB is designed to inform parents and we haven't informed parents. This year, Pine Ridge won't find out until probably mid-October what their AUIP determination is. Mm -hmm. Last year, we didn't, we didn't find out last fall's data until April. I'm not even sure when the letters went out the year before, but I know that we have a consistent problem of informing parents. And we are expected in the restructuring and the corrective action planning process to include parents in how we improve our schools. And I know as the leader in the restructuring process for Wounded Knee District School, we have parent meetings on a, on a quarterly basis. So every three months, we sit down with parents, not only uh, our parent committee, but we have general meetings across the whole community asking people to come in and talk about the school. We have to inform them. And if we don't get data back quickly or in, or in a timely fashion, uh, then we have problems. Well, let me um, thank you uh, all for for your testimony, and uh, let me just say that it's uh, it's deplorable that, uh, as you indicated, 95% of Native American boys will not finish high school, 
I mean, that's uh, it's totally unacceptable. It's genocide uh, in a educational genocide, and if you're not prepared, you're dead. And so, uh, I I would hope, Mr. Chairman, we could follow up and uh, and uh, see if there can uh, be some uh, some uh, change, a quantum leap in in uh, what is going on. Once again, let me thank you for calling this very important hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Pan, and thank you for your continued interest and involvement in the Indian education. Uh, I'm going to thank uh, the witnesses. Uh, hopefully this can be one of those turning points. We brought some very, very important people together here this morning at the same table. And I hope this can be a turning point. I've been here 32 years, and I think things are somewhat better, but I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm impatient, uh, you know, with uh, our efforts to try to improve Indian education. We need dollars. We need cents in cooperation. Working with you, you have levels of expertise that are extremely important. I think all of us up here and you out there have a moral obligation, really, because you've all been given a responsibility in one way or, or another to help develop Indian education in this country. And we should take that a as a, a moral obligation. So thank you uh, for your testimony this morning. It's been a very informative meeting. I hope that everyone you know, leaves here today with renewed commitment to working together on the state, federal, and tribal level to uh, work as equals. And I think it's so important as you walk into that room to recognize that you are walking in, talking to equals, that they are real sovereignties, that it's not the Knights of Columbus, as much as I like the Knights of Columbus. It's not the VFW. It's a sovereign group. So we want to have, make sure that we make use of the great benefits of Indian culture and Indian language to overcome the great challenges of, of facing Indian education. And you are the people, and we up here. Let's work together. Let's really take that as an obligation. And we are told that we are to be seekers after justice. And uh, I'm convinced that all of you are that, that you really want justice. The question is how we can best achieve that justice. Um, several years ago, uh, I introduced the three bills to recognize, um, to reaffirm the recognition of three tribes in Michigan, Little Traverse, Little River, and the Pukagan Band of Potawatomi. Thank God they had saved great records. They had great genealogical studies, and, but we did it through the congressional process and passed three laws. And I asked President Clinton at that time if he would have a bill signing ceremony in the Oval Office, and he agreed to do so. So the three chiefs from Michigan that came down with many of their citizens, and by the way, I always use the word citizen rather than member, because I think citizen really illustrates sovereignty. You know, the United States of Columbus has members, but Indian tribes have citizens, right? But we filled the Oval Office, and the president used probably 30 different pins, you know, W, and passed the pin out, I, L, for three different bills. And when he finished, the president's very gregarious, and he'd get up and just wandering around, shaking hands and hugging everybody. And the three chief executives, the three chiefs of the tribes, were still standing there with me behind the desk. So I turned to them and I said, why don't you sit down in the president's chair? And one of the U.S. senators said, Dale, I don't think we can do that. I said, no, we can't because we're not chief executives of sovereign nations. These three guys are. So they took turns sitting down in the, the president's chair, which was a, 
a, a great thing, I thought. And they, they, they had their pictures there sitting in the, in the Oval Office and the President's chair. I did tell one of them on the way out that, you know, the only thing I ever had in that chair was my eye. But, um, but uh, they actually occupied it. Uh, and it, I think illustrations of sovereignty are important. But the real recognition, the day-by-day -day things that touch people's life of sovereignty is more important than the symbolism. In this area of education, I started out my life being a teacher. I got, taught school for 10 years. From there, moved into this arena. But education is so important. So as you meet with one another, as you meet with uh, in your respective capacities, recognize that that sovereignty is a real thing, and that you're going in there dealing with people, uh, not one with a higher degree of authority than the other, but people who have the obligation to protect the sovereignty of their respected governments. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, can you yield for a second? Yeah, Mr. Payne, yeah. Yeah, let me just mention that about 18 years ago, I guess it was, that um, the Congressman uh, Major Owens, who chaired the then Select Committee on Education, uh, had uh, hearings. Uh, we went to Santa Fe. We went to several of the um, Native American nations and, and actually met with tribal leaders even in traditional programs and it was uh, very, very exciting and very interesting and perhaps sometime in, in the future, next year or the following year, we can, um, we can revisit some of the um, areas where we can really get firsthand knowledge of, uh, of what is happening there. And so I, I remember it as if it were just yesterday and it, like I said, it was almost 20 years ago. So I um, just wanted to mention that, Mr. Chairman. If I can take just another two minutes, uh, about 31 years ago, I started to visit Indian schools out west. Carl Perkins was chairman, and I kept adding amendments to education bills, saying that they would always would say that SEA, state education agencies, LEAs, local education agencies, were eligible recipients. And I always added an amendment, say, and Indian tribes for all the education bills. And he, he would accept all these amendments. So finally he said, now we don't have an Indian education subcommittee, but could you head up a task force? So I used to travel to Indian schools. And I'll tell you, uh, that was 31 years ago. I, I visited some Indian schools that a federal judge would have not allowed prisoners to be in. I know because we had a, a jail in Genesee County, uh, my, uh, my uh, district back home that the federal judge ordered it torn down. We blew it up actually. Blew it up because it was not fit for human habitation. Um, actually the Flint public school system would have been happy to get that building. But it was, it was better than some, much better than some of the Indian schools I was visiting. And I determined then that we really, really had to move fast. And that was 31 years ago and that's not been fast. We have so much to do. We have such an obligation. And when we can spend trillions of dollars and billions of dollars and other things, we certainly can spend some money to invest in the education of those people from whom we took much land, took many other things. As a matter of fact, let me just finish by saying this. I introduced, I mentioned the bill to the Michigan Indian Tuition Waiver Act, where any Michigan Indian could go to college and the state pays the tuition. That's still the law of Michigan. But I introduced that because I went down and read the Treaty of Detroit. And the treaty promised education. And while it was a treaty with the federal government, the beneficiary really turned out to be the state of Michigan getting all that land. And I felt that uh, they should carry out their obligation. So 31 years is a long time. I hope I've made some progress, but I still feel guilty we have not made enough progress. But uh, again, we have to work hard. Um, 
Do you have anything, any closing remarks before I? Again, I want to thank Governor Castle for his continued presence. He's, he's always present at these hearings, and uh, that is extremely important, and I appreciate that. Um, as previously ordered, uh, members will have seven calendar days to submit additional materials for the uh, hearing record. Any member who wishes to submit follow-up questions in writing to the witnesses should coordinate with majority staff within the requisite time. Without objection, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.